Welcome to our YouTube channel. This is The Point of View. Tonight, we're speaking to a man who wants to be president. He says he can run the country with just 20 ministers. He will upload all non-performing state enterprises. He will decentralize government and hold elections for DCEs. Samankra wants to be president from January 7, 2025. We'll talk to him when we come back. If you like this video, kindly share and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more exclusive content. So welcome back. My guest tonight is Sam Sapon Ankara, an investment banker, a development economist, and a presidential hopeful. Is that right? Is that is that a good description of you? It is. A presidential hopeful. Presidential aspirant, yes. Aspirant. Hopeful. On an independent ticket. Yes, please. You don't want to form a political party? No. Oh, we'll, we'll come to that. But who are you? Well, Sam Ankara is a very young, humble man. Um, who started his, his education from a Pokuari secondary school um, to this form. I left England to further my education mm. and then developed myself into the investment banking environment. And then from there, I've been an entrepreneur, setting up different brokerages, starting from hedge funds to private equity, mm. and also build myself in economics, global economics, and also um, specializing in the African economics as well. So you're a finance and economics guy? So I'm a finance and economics guy. Born in Ghana? Born and bred in Ghana. Uh, Opoku High School, Form 1 to Upper 6? Yes, Upper Form 2. What year was this? I started in 1986, Opoku School. 1986, Form 1? Yeah, that's Opoku High School. Found so you probably year. finished in 91 or 92? Yeah, 91, 92. I see. And what did you study in Opoku I was a, I was a science student, uh, and then I got into do um, Arts and SS form. Okay, so science one to uh, so all level one, science yes, and then sixth form. That's right. And then you went to to the UK. I went to UK to read statistics and economics for my, uh, management the first year. All right. And then I, I went further to do my MBA again in finance and then studied P MSc in economics, PhD in um, finance. So you have finance and economics. So so why why politics or why do you? Are you seem to be doing well? You're, you're, you're making money, investment banking, lucrative. So why do you want to come and worry yourself? Well, that's a question that everyone is asking me. A lot of people are asking me this question, why do you want to get into it? But Bernard, it gets to a point where we have to leave for something. Mm. Um, I have I'm somebody that grew up helping young people, building young community projects, developing young people into entrepreneurship and other career paths. I like to help the deprived, mostly women, and people who are disadvantaged. And I'm also the kind of person that, when I sit back and I think things are not going right, and I have the know-how, I want to get in and help and support. So with this sort of background, and sitting back looking at our country, the amount of resources we have, both human capital and natural resources, mm. and all the opportunities, and yet we're a very poor third world country. It beats my imagination. So I have been researching, wanting to see exactly what is going wrong and why with all this we can't do well as a nation. Mm. And again, started advising governments, writing policies and writing in the papers, writing directly to them to be able to see if we can shape policy and bring things into birth. But fortunately, none of these things were able to go far. So uh, I've been speaking to key people who understand the terrain very well, and they say, Sam, you are a change maker. The kind of ideas and things that you have, it's, you are not, if you are not in the helm of affairs and you are sitting outside throwing them in, knowing the structures we have and the systems we have, it won't go far. So if you really mean to help Ghanaians, if you really want to have a make an impact and bring change, then deny yourself and throw yourself on the line and let, and let Ghanaians understand and hear exactly what you think you can bring to bear. Mm. And I believe that if people get to hear you and understand exactly how you want to help, they will support you and let you lead so we can take this country to where it belongs. So what exactly is wrong with the country that you want to fix? A lot. Everything, to be honest. Um, everything? Everything, to be honest. And uh, wow. from the rule of law to government systems to the real economic policies to execution, 
all these basic things are not in the right places. I mean, we live in a country where a policeman can stop you going home and you have everything correct and yet you are parked on the side for hours non-stop because he wants, to, he wants something which you are not given. And a, another car will park with raggedy car with no MOT, nothing, insurance, anything. But they drop five cities, ten cities, and they go. And we think it's right in the system. Nobody questions these things because you don't want to waste your time. So everybody gets in there, you have to give and go. These are how it starts. And it ends, it's, it's dragged all the way to the top. So for us to be able to address issues as a country, we need to look at these critical things seriously. And I believe that looking at the current political systems we have, the structures, even how they obtain ways to get into power, is very difficult for people to be able to execute effectively. And the only way we can get this done is coming from the outside. And that is why I opted not to join any political party, but coming from the outside to help shape, build this country for all of us to enjoy, as we've seen elsewhere in developed countries. So you're saying nothing is working, rule of law is not working, the system is not working, but isn't that, is it not the same system that you are going to be part of? Because now you want to be president. We've run the Fourth Republic for 30 years. It's the most successful republic. The first three were truncated by coups, so this is successful. So even though things are not perfect, some would say we are much better than we were, I don't know, 40 years ago. So is that not evidence that things are improving naturally? Well, it, things are improving naturally, but the pace of which things are going is where the challenge is. Mm. And again, although it appears things are improving, I believe that it could be much, much better. For a developing country, the kind of growth that we need is not what we are seeing. I mean, our constitution, first of all, needs to be looked into critically to uh, several reviews on so many areas, starting from uh, presidential appointments through to um, decoupling uh, IGP's position from being appoint appointment, having an independent um, national planning commission to be able to develop a 10, 15 year, 20 year plan enshrine the constitution that binds everybody that comes after. There's a lot of things that needs to be reviewed. If you want to see real seriousness in our development as a nation, we have to consider all these things. I mean, again, our, our remuneration our, uh, sector where there's Article 25, uh, 75 for certain people and it is a single spine for other people. All these inconsistencies and inequalities in our distribution of income, all these things have to look into as a nation. So we, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I believe that the current systems and structures do not favor. I mean, look at government size. Look at the kind of budget we allocate. And all our, these are the things that co causes corruption. If there's a lot of people from different sectors doing different things for government, idle, they have to find ways of making money and it, it leads to corruption. Trim down government size, that's you trim down your expenditure. And then obviously, you know, you are working towards something meaningful. So I believe that there's a lot to be done, although we, we feel or we, there's a few things have been done already, but I believe that the pace at which it's going is not what a developing nation needs. If you really want to develop as a country, then a lot more needs to be done, and the current structures do not favor that. And that is why I'm coming in as an independent candidate with unencumbered with any party or any affiliate standing in to help use Ghanaians to build Ghana. So is it your view that political parties are not in a position to do what you've just said? Absolutely. To be honest, again, by the time people come through the ranks, you just look at the primaries for parliamentary seats, even for argument's sake. Look at the amount of money that people are paying even to win. By the time they get into the seat and find that money that they've wasted or they've invested, it's two, three years down the line, and the next year is an election. So they are looking for the next money to win the next election. And th that cycle keeps continuing. Mm. This has been the status quo. So I am saying, if you, if you ask them again, they can look into your eyes and generally tell you that, look, we have challenges. And the challenges that we've got ourselves incumbent whilst in the position. I've spoken to party, some of these party leaders, and they have been honest because they know the parties need to keep afloat. Even when in opposition, they have to borrow. They have to get themselves involved in all sorts of things. So 
they are encumbered. Their hands are tied. Decisions can't be made. There's a lot of policies, but execution is nil. So if we want to see seriousness, then Ghanaians start to think outside the box. We can't keep doing the same old stuff and expect different results. We have to start looking at what are the problems, what are the challenges. These guys gave us all sorts of promises. They get into the seat and nothing happens. What are the causes? Have we asked these questions, Bernard? Have we interrogated this further? So I am telling you that we've done extensive research on this and we realize that, look, if we don't turn around from how we are building our country, we'll wake up one day, we probably don't even have a country. So let me get you clear. You're, you're saying that the system that brings people to power is corrupt. Absolutely. And therefore, you want to use a different system to come to power. Absolutely. So how do you intend to raise money for your campaign? Well, um, I come from the business world. And this business that I work in, or the environment I come in, investment banking, building funds of funds, we have within people that can even contribute towards social impact projects. Um, basically, these are people that put their funds into systems where they feel people are deprived, and if we're going to invest to uplift them, their living standards, they will do so. So in this kind of situation, it falls under it as well. Again, I have, we have crowdfunding. We have different, so my background as an investment banker, raising funding will come into bear here where we'll have creative, innovative ways of raising money without going to seek big money from big houses to be responsible or to be liable to people or to get ourselves encumbered so that policies that would free our people and give them the right benefit would not be implemented because somebody has, one way or the other, mm. contributed or helped us to come to power. It's very interesting. You are an investment banker. I, I think that's an interesting point. So, yes, so let's assume that what you're saying is true, that because of the way they get money to do campaigns, they are incumbent, so corruption becomes a problem. So, fine, you raise money miraculously because you are an investment banker. Not miraculously. But the system that keeps us poor is not just corruption. The economic system we run is not fit for purpose. You know this. Yeah. You're an economist. So if you say... Corruption is just one of the problems. We don't add enough value to what we produce. Yeah. We spend a lot of money importing everything. Yeah. And we spend two billion importing food. One billion importing finished products. That's three billion, same as IMF gave us. So let's assume you deal with the corruption part, but that still doesn't solve our problem. Right. Again, like I said, the corruption part slips through everything. Why are we important? Why are we not having homegrown policies to produce what we consume? What is stopping us from doing so? Why do we have to go to the bush, cut timber, distance away, heavy loads, destroy heavy investments we've made on roads, and go to the harbor, export it, and import it back 2,000% of the price? Why are we importing toothpicks? Why are we importing tomatoes in an arable area like Ghana, where everywhere is so fertile, you leave an or orange fruit, a seed here, tomorrow you come, it's germinating. Why? Why are we doing these things? You got to ask yourself these questions. Because people are taking the shortcuts because the system allows that. If I come to power and I only have four years to maneuver, and there's nothing binding me from doing anything, I take the easiest route how quick I can make money with myself and my immediate people, and then we leave. And that has been the musical chairs between the two parties. MPP come to power, they see what are the quickest opportunities for them to get into, buy and sell, get their cats out, and then leave. NDC takes the same, it's the same policies. I mean, it's one party more or less. We need to see how do we address this problem? How can we solve the fundamentals? Who is ready to sacrifice? I mean, I've, you hear people saying, why do we have to go, to go austerity when we are leaving government for the other guys to come and work so that people think they are doing well? These are the kind of statements coming from politicians. So in effect, the ruling is not for the country, but it's for themselves. Have we thought about these things? So you're saying there's no difference between NDC and MPP? Absolutely. It's one party system. I mean, you, One party system? It's a one party system at the top. Look, they will make noise, they will fight against each other, but in the end, the result is the same. No execution, just talk, just uh, what you call it, slogans. You don't see any results. So I am saying, look, 
if Ghanaians are serious about having a better condition of living, if Ghanaians are serious about their lifestyle changing, then they're going to be serious thinking about their political, the political system and who they elect next. Very this election is everything. This 2024 election? This 2024 is everything. It means it's, it's everything for us. Our education, our economy, employment, healthcare, infrastructure, personal standard of living depends on these elections. We either take this opportunity and change things around or stay on the status quo and stop complaining. I'm still concerned about how you want to raise money because and the fact that you're an investment banker even worries me more because the, the, the market is what has brought us here. We've gone to the market and borrowed so often. Indeed, our finance minister is an investment banker. So when I ask you how you're going to raise money and you say you're an investment banker, everybody who gives you money has an agenda. Absolutely. And, and Wall Street or the city or whoever is going to give you money obviously wants control. So I'm a bit concerned about that. Can you, uh, how do you convince me that you're not going to perpetuate the capitalist system that has kept us really at the fringes? Because you do know, again, the neoliberal economic system, which places the shareholder and profits above everything else, is partly responsible for where we are with multinational companies that exploit our resources and they repatriate profits in the millions of dollars. And they don't really transfer technology. There's no plan for value addition in a substantive way. So coming from that background is actually more concerning for me now. It's leadership. It boils down to the leader. Again, the fact that somebody from a background has done something doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else that comes from there think the same. If you read my profile, I've been involved in social impact funds. Funds where people put in with no intention of having it back, with no interest. These investments go into projects, housing in deprived areas, SMEs, investment into private businesses so that people's livelihood, they have upward mobility. It, it's, these are available to be uh, available and these are funds that any meaningful person that wants to help. And again, it's not every candidate would such investments come to you or such support would come to you. So, yes, somebody might have been an investment banker, but what has been their track record in the industry? Who are they attracting? I am not attracting capitalist funds to come and be a bed on Ghanaians. Like I said, I'm a change agent. It's only a fool that keeps doing the same thing and expecting to have a change. It's only a fool that keeps taking the same route and expecting to go to a different destination. If my predecessors have gone through this point and they get themselves incumbent, why would I want to do the same? So it's a but total... If, if you say you are... So a couple of points there. Um, impact investment funds one profit. The only difference with, between them and regular funds is no. that they also want a social benefit. So it's like the, the, the co so, so if you have a, an, if an impact investor, yes, you want educational benefit or housing, but you still want a pecuniary profit. So that's why they call it it's like the middle way. Yeah. So I don't think it's quite a, a bit accurate to say no, that. No, there, 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 are set, there are different layers of impact funding. Some is commercial and some is entirely voluntarily. Voluntary investment like charity or charity investment. They don't even look to get it back. They put it in, make sure they check the impacts. And they're, like, going, to, and they're going to support your campaign to be president? Well, I mean, like I said, if I present, I, I present myself credible enough, if I'm able to show that I'm capable of delivering Ghanaians from the destined position they're in and, and bringing them into the light, people would... But, but you as an investor, if you wanted to hedge your bets on a candidate, you would obviously look at his chances of winning. You look at his track record. You don't have a political track record. So why will an impact investment fund give you money to come and run for president with no base, with no track record in politics? I, I have a serious base. And as I'm speaking now, I'm talking to my base. There's a lot of Ghanaians out there who are looking for this kind of person like me to come and lead or be their flag bearer. It's just that they haven't gotten it. And I'm, that's why I availed myself for it. And even before I even thought of running as a president, I have told the nation to almost every school, secondary schools and universities, talking to young people, 
The young people speak to me. They feel they've been neglected. They feel people are not taking them serious. They, they feel their voices are not heard. And these are the base I talk to on a regular basis. So the idea that I don't have a base is totally wrong. And again, for a strategic business person like me, to get myself into this field, we've got to do a lot of feasibility work on the ground and assess the possibilities of a win. And I'm telling you, we've done extensive work. And you can do a bit of, a little bit of, uh, what do you call it, um, pull here, pull in here, even within this organization. Nine out of 10 Ghanaians you speak to are sick and tired of voting and not getting results. They are looking for a credible option to put their vote in there. And that is what I present. And that's what. Well, the, the first part of your statement may be true, but whether the second part follows is the other point. So, yes, Ghanaians may be tired of the status quo, but whether they think that you are the man to lead them is the question we're trying to answer. We're talking to Samankra. He says he wants to be president of an independent ticket. He has some very interesting ideas. We'll test some of his economic ideas when we come back. We are live, so you can send us your comments as well. I need to say that I've received some interesting comments for you already, and I'll reach some as the program proceeds. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. My guest is Sam Ankara. He says he wants to run for president in 2024 as an independent candidate. And he says the system is not working, rule of law is not working. It's too expensive to, to become a politician using our political system. He's going to come as an independent. He raised money as an investment banker. He says he would deal with the constitution. Corruption is a big challenge. Um, let me read a few comments. This one says, Bernard, we truly and dearly need a third force in Ghana. And then there's one that's very interesting. Ernest says, Bernard, please ask your guest to give me, to give my young NGO, Fobak Ghana, just a small fraction of the money he wants to spend on such an adventure to help our cause. <laughs> so Ernest obviously thinks that you're going to, you are wasting your money. All right, so the, the challenge with most people is the economy, right? So what's your economic idea? Okay, first and foremost, what, what is the current government doing wrong in the economy? And how do you intend to fix that? Brilliant. I mean, to be able to assess the situation well, let's look at how we got here. Mm. What could have been done? Did we do the right things? And what could have been done? And how do we get out of it? I think if we do that, we'll have a clearer understanding of what has gone wrong. Let's go back to, uh, it started from NDC's administration, Doomsaw. We call the energy crisis mm. when um, government had issues with power and companies didn't have power. Mm -hmm. Factories were closed down. Com companies were running in. A, they didn't have. I mean, power was being rationed, mm -hmm. so obviously they were not running properly, and taxes obviously was very low. And you know, countries are run by taxes, so they couldn't raise enough taxes. Mm. So Doomsaw really caused a, a dent. And then they went to the banking crisis. A lot of money was borrowed to capitalize banking. Mm -hmm. And we have most of the cases still in court mm -hmm. where people took money and then obviously did not, didn't do what it's supposed to do. So again, that also caused a dent into our situation. MPP won the election. They also thought the banking system needs to be cleaned. In their case, they didn't want to uh, capitalize the bank, but they, want, they used money to close banks. So again, we, won, we, we started borrowing money. They went and borrowed a lot of money to get into that situation. And then went on spending spree, borrowing spree. All this is borrowing money. Free bees, free education, one district, one down, one this and one that basically spending as if the physical space was free for them to do so. But if you look at this history of what had happened during the NDC, any economy, anybody that wants to build a real economy, economic fundamentals for a nation would not even look at spending. You see how you go through austerity period and save the nation and, and save as much as possible and then bring back the economy into levels. But they went on spending spree and employing about 150 or 125 ministers with their deputies 
free education, free one district, one dam. One is all these were heavy investment, and what did they do? Borrow money because there were not enough taxes. And then basically, they have to even support budget. Can you imagine borrowing money for recurrent expenditure? You borrow money to pay salaries. Mm. You, borrow, so in, you only borrow money when you are investing to get results, knowing the money can be paid off the, uh, the loan you are borrowing for. But you don't borrow for these things. You have idle state enterprises like Tema Oil Refinery, certain idle. You borrow money, you use, you use borrowed money to pay salaries of workers. I mean, some of these decisions you don't understand. Then unfortunately within that period, COVID snapped. It exposed us because again, no taxes coming in to pay back your loans, the loans that you've borrowed, mm. and you are exposed. And then Ukraine war also ended up. So you can see that there's a pattern. And the reason why this happened is what I said to you earlier, that because these parties are looking after themselves only and their immediate families and people that help them to power, the real doing of the economy is not there. Because these are decisions that basic economics tells you that you don't spend more than you earn. But we are spending far more than we are earning as a country. So this is what I believe. We will slash down completely government entities and people that government employ. We're going to offload some of these entities, white elephant entities, into the private sector. And what I mean by offloading is not these backroom deals where party faithfuls are rewarded and given these assets. These are going to be open, transparent transaction mm. where these assets will be offloaded to people that have the capacity and the capability to run them. Mm. Profitable. And then government reduces them, the burdens away, away, themselves away from these liabilities. Because I don't see where anywhere in the world where a refinery, for instance, run at a loss. It doesn't make sense. So let's offload things government can't run to the private sector, capable entities that have the know-how to do it, and let's focus in administering the country, making sure the rule of law works, proper systems that gives back our businesses, having mm. a proper, proper enabling environment, government structures that does not hold and delay policies, transparent systems that in real time, you know I have to go to land registry to register my land, it's two weeks after two weeks, the title is in my post. These are the kind of systems that we need to have in place as a country if we're mm. serious. So let me, let me get you right. The economic challenges started with doing so, and then the financial sector clean up, and then COVID. So this is very similar to what the Minister of Finance has been saying. So you've said the doing so, the financial sector, and the COVID, like three levels of crisis. And then the government also then went on a borrowing spree. Borrowing spree. And then and they, they spent on things that they thought didn't matter. So which of the items of expenditure was not necessary? Because they did free SHS, which is something a lot of people consider to be very important. Uh, they said they wanted to do planting for food and jobs, which on paper sounds like a good idea. Um, you said one village, one dam. That's debatable. But my point is, there's a role for government in stimulating education, stimulating agriculture. So when you say they went on a spending spree, can you elaborate? What, what is it that they spent it the wrong way, they, they, they overbloated the expenditure, or that the expenditure item itself was not necessary? What do you mean by that? First of all, the government size was huge. So that's a lot of waste going in. Mm. Now, the expenditure, as you rightly said, wasn't spent on the right places. Our education needs a total overhaul, not a free education. Our curriculum is outdated. Our facilities, our amenities are, not, are basically not fit for purpose. There is a clause in our constitution that says primary education has to be free. Is it free? Everybody has to have access to it. So if you want to address free, address it at the right places. There's a new statistic that just came out. 900,000 young people that came from KG, only 600 were able to get into primary school. Whereas our constitution tells us that there has to be free educa basic education. So what is that happening? So going on making a slogan, free education for secondary, it's not really the solution in our education sector. 
We need to revamp our education total, total overhaul. Teachers are not paid properly. They are not having the right conditions to live in. I mean, they are not motivated. So what are we talking about here? Just championing with a free education does not solve the problem. And again, it's lowering the standards of education in the country. All our top schools that you and I went to, go back and see, it's not as it is before. Because it's so-called free, government don't have the enough resources to pump in, and it's hanging in the air wishy-washy. Is that what we are looking for as a country? Look, education is so crucial for the life of this country. For this country to see any light of development and advancement, our education should be our number one priority. And having just a free education stamped in the middle of it is not the solution. So that money was not spent appropriately. And I'm saying, you're talking about free, uh, one district, one dam, and all of those things. If you build a decent economy, where economy is flourishing, yes, government can do social intervention projects, but it doesn't require a government to make these provisions. The system would build itself. Really? We live in Accra. So government doesn't need to invest in agriculture? Government needs to, obviously, for subsidies and so forth. But on a higher scale, if we are looking to make money out of agriculture, this is not just government investing food for planting for trees. It's about creating an enabling environment, sorting your land tenure issues out, making investors comfortable and, and confident in the economy so they can invest, having technology. These are the things that attract funding. So let's stop these slogans and these noise about trying to make something work where we know it doesn't work. We know the template. Solve your enabling environment, have the land tenure system sorted out, invite technology into the country, and people will be chasing now, with who, money. Who is, for, going to, who is going to give you technology? To, to, I mean, good. Why, why is techno, is technology for free? Why do you think the WTO, the number one dispute there between China India on one hand and the West is about technology. So you think, you think someone's going to give you technology for free no. just because you, you, you want technology? It's a private sector driven attraction. So once you go to places like Israel who are far advanced with, in, the, in technology and farming, you speak to those that would want to invest in here. The requirement on the ground is you have to partner with a local Ghanaian entity. Just you can set out the basis one that's happened. But they are the, not just bringing the, the technology the current, for free. The current, they minister, are bringing the, in. the current minister for Agri, at least the one who's running for president, did go to Israel. I've seen videos of him in Israel talking to people. In fact, they sent teams to go and understudy Israel. So I'm not sure how new that is. Whether the fact that people go and learn from somewhere translates into anything positive, I'm not sure. Brilliant. Because this Israel thing has been... Even this particular minister has done the same thing. So I'm not even sure what you're talking about when you talk about let's go to Israel. Br brilliant, um, Bernard. It's not just going there. What is a strategy? If you are going to learn, that's a different ball game. And again, that shifts the liability or the responsibility on government again. Government should keep its hands out of this. What I'm saying is create an enabling environment, invite those with technology to come and do business with you. You are not coming to go, you are not going there to train uh, for a week or two or six or whatever and think you're a master to come and invest there, come and uh, adopt the technology. No. Give them the room, like what Zimbabwe did years ago. When they have all these uh, farmers farming on their land, obviously there were issues with the land tenure system, which we're not going to go into detail, but the concept was perfect. Take your hands out of business as a government, let the private sector drive itself. Concentrate on but the where in environment. The world, where in the world does that work? In the U.S., government is in business. In the U.K., what? government is in business. In what China, China's model of economic development is very government. So I'm not sure no, no. What, what you're saying when you say what? What so we? government should create an environment for who? Which private sector? Do you think private sector is the solution to our problems that all government needs to do is to create an environment? No, that, that's it's, not, it's not a solution. But if the private sector is addressed properly, a lot of the challenges that you and I are having here will be resolved. We haven't this discussion because we've overborrowed and we are bankrupt because government is doing everything and they are not doing it well. So we need to now be smart and say what causes this inefficiencies? Is it because of skill? Is it personnel? Is it because of the know-how? 
these are the questions you ask. And I am saying to you here that the reason why these government entities are not producing, and the reason why we are not getting the results that we're looking for as people is because they are not run properly. And the best way to get it is bring qualified expertise to run what they have to run, stay there as a government, take your taxes, run your administration, and let the private sector drive the economy. So this is your private sector driving economy is interesting point for me. But you said you can run the country with 20 ministers or 20 ministries. 20 ministries or 20 ministers? 20 ministers. I mean, we said that because the main objective... 20 ministers? Yes. We're looking to decentralize government. So Every which ministers, which ministries would you scrap? We will go into details of it when we roll out our policies on the 21st of September. That's when we launch our election. But we have 20 ministers. And the reason why we're doing this, we want to decentralize government to make sure that every region presents what they are best in. If you look around the world, our country, the northern part, uh, what do you call it? Um, Shea butter, cashew. You come in here, cocoa, goat. Every region has a unique selling point as to why we haven't capitalized on these things and make these regions run itself is unbelievable. We've centralized everything here, and that gain has enhanced so much corruption. Yeah, but I, I struggle to see how decentralization solves the problem of multiplicity of ministries. I, I'm not sure if I follow you, because the, 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 the current government has a number of ministries, right? So I, I needed you to tell me, so is it trade or finance or defense? Which ministry are you going to cut? Because it says, it says 20. Yeah, tw I mean... We have ministry for sanitation and water. We have ministry for housing. We have ministry for this. Look, most of these all can be uh, by, together as one, one entity. And like I said, we will roll out our policies on the 21st of September when we officially launch. You will hear very robust, radical policies that will turn this country from where we are to prosperity. And this is where you know that the base that I'm talking about will be so excited at least somebody make the effort to solve our problems once and for all. Well, I, I thought you would give me examples, but no problem. Let's, let's, so, <laughs> IMF, do we, what, what's your thinking? The, will the IMF pro, what will the IMF program do for us? Well, again, why do we have to sit down as a country and allow somebody to come from outside to tell us what to do? What IMF is telling us to do is what we should do for ourselves if we are running a country properly. We don't need anyone to tell you how to spend your money or to have to spend money you but haven't they are, got. They are giving you $3 billion. Yeah, so we, we basically... Do you, have a, do, you have a, do you have an alternative to that? To be honest... So if, if you're the finance minister's advisor, when the president said in July 2022 that we should go to IMF and negotiate the program, would you have said we shouldn't go? Well, I mean, at that point when we had lost every credibility and we're in that state, I don't think there was much to do. But what I'm saying is, as a country like Ghana, we don't need IMF at all in any of our dealings if we run our country well. If we cut our government size, if we cut spending, or if we cut all the leakages and the excesses in the system, we don't need IMF for $3 billion or for credibility. The reason why we are the crimes and crimes and capitals of the IMF is because we've not done things properly. We're spending money we're not supposed to spend. We're borrowing to pay recurrent expenditure. We've been exposed by COVID, and now we have nowhere to turn to than to take our caps to the IMF and the World Bank for support. This has been a cycle, all because of our system of governance, which I talked about. If we are able to structure ourselves well, when credible, serious-minded people with know-how get into the harm of affairs, imagine having proper experts running Ghana as a proper entity. We would never, ever turn our back into IMF to go and look for funds. But, but it's one thing knowing the problem. It's another thing if you are the man to solve it. We'll come back and deal with that. I'm still trying to get into the mind of Sam Ankara. He says he wants to run for president in 2024. He wants to be an independent candidate. said a lot of things about the economy. So what makes him think he's the right person to do these things he's saying he wants to do? Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're still on the point of view tonight. My guest is Sam Ankra, and he is um, investment banker, economist, finance guy. He says he has a track record. He's going to run for president in 2024. I, I'm not sure if you, you've thought about the Ghanaian voter deeply enough in terms of how an independent candidate is going to perform. Because we've had a lot of independent candidates who have not done well. In fact, in the last election, the candidate that came third was had a political party. It's called GUM. So that people identify with the party at the base so that he has MP aspirants. So the independent candidate thing, I'm not sure if I get it. So, okay. I, I mean, how, how are you going to get it done? Yeah, how are you going to? Because, the, okay, I don't want to judge you based on the past, but no independent candidate has ever come even close. Right, so... I'm not sure if this your independent candidate thing is 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 well thought through. Bernard is very well thought through, very well researched. As you know, I'm a researcher myself. Look, the timing is everything. Ghanaians have this time not to fail again. What happened four years ago is not exactly what is happening now. The systems and the economy and everything that we're going through now calls for this kind of change. It's no more party colors or symbols. It's Ghana first for everybody. Like I said earlier, if we are very serious to solve or come to get these crises to an end, then we've got to start thinking differently in everything from our voting or who we elect to run this nation. We've been I would say we've been corn with political colors and symbols for a while, and that hasn't given us the results that we're looking for. Let's look for an alternative. I come unencumbered. I have the whole nation Ghana as my pool of talent and resources to pick from to lead and run this country. Can you imagine having access to Ghanaians both home and abroad with the right know-how coming, coming back to Ghana to help build this nation? So many people want to help but they don't want to be part of this political system or the political affiliation to any party. These people don't get a chance to support because they don't support one party, they are left out. Or they don't support the other party, they are left out. It's time we have real Ghanaians around Ghana. Ghanaians who understand what to do. Not people that shouted on political platforms, but people who have the capacity and the ability and who can deliver on KPIs. So what is your, okay, what, what is your track record in leadership i have led by example in all the organizations that i've run i ran gamank which was zero to about um, a 500 million a year turnover corporation i've run african investment group which figures you can see online so basically i have built organizations from scratch but these are these are these are safe aig is it's an safe. investment organization yeah. right well, so running an investment, a president is a very complicated thing. I understand that. So the fact that you run an AIG or whatever to whatever profit level in a Western country, you, I, you've not even worked in Ghana. I've worked in Ghana. Gamank, I mentioned, was a Ghanaian, or a Ghanaian company, registered company. So what I'm saying is there, there are certain skills regardless of which environment you're in. I am a hard worker. I work I'm a resource-oriented person. But there are lots of hard-working, resource-oriented people in I'm politics. coming in. So that's I'm, not enough. So no, no, I'm, I'm, I haven't finished. I'm, I'm, yeah. I was giving you the attributes, the aforesaid attributes. These are what is needed. And I said to you earlier, I am coming in also unencumbered, not attached to anybody. So I have the whole country to run with a free hand to make the right decisions, to appoint and fire people who don't perform, because but that is you, not... Okay. That is not happening. How, can, how can you work with people you've not... You've, how do you appoint people you don't know? Because the fact <laughs> that there's 20, 40 million Ghanaians or whatever number... Companies, companies do recruitment and employ skilled talents every so, day. So you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to do recruitment. It's going to be done on those bases. But, you but you recognize there'll still be a parliament. Absolutely. So there'll be a parliament of which you have no... Control of. No control of. Listen, there's a, the most important... Or not, that, not, not no influence. The people influence. I mean, when Ghanaians, the populace, because at the end of the day, it's not for the uh, 200 people sitting in the room that represent Ghana. It's a whole nation that represents Ghana. So when the populace look at the policies and the, 
importance and the value is going to create and the development is bringing and somebody sits in parliament and wants to sabotage the people themselves to make a decision but what, what about okay who who are some of the people who will be your ministers we have the best team look uh, even now we have the best team even in the in the political terrain there. you have the best team absolutely can you give me two names I don't want to start bringing names out yet. Like I said, we're launching our uh, campaign from the 21st of September. So this, is a, this, so this is a teaser. These are pre-campaign interviews. Once we get to the campaign, uh, what you call the launch itself, you will see the caliber of people that support this vision that wants Ghana to be where it belongs to. No, I thought it would be nice to give me at least a couple. So who will be your running mate? <laughs> Again, uh, Bernard, I want to leave that for 21st. You see, all of this information will be out there. 21st, you, 21st of September. Why, why that date? It's a World Freedom Day. And we believe that Ghana needs freedom. So that is a day that Ghana is going to have its freedom officially. It's World Freedom Day? Yes. You do recognize that as Nkrumah's birthday? Absolutely. Coincidentally, it's Nkrumah's birthday as well. So second independence. We are calling for a second independence. So what's your political ideology? This status, I am, I'm not an ideologist, but I, ha, I, have, I, I have believed in leaders that do well. And Nkrumah is one of them, and to an extent, for what he did for the nation. So in the spectrum of economic ideas from extreme socialists to the left to extreme capitalists on the right, where do you stand? I stand in between. Anything that helps in development and progress, that is what I stand for. So we are calling for a second independence on the 21st of September. No, but, but everything that, there, there are many things that can give you progress, but there's also a cost. So if you say you want to be president, we need to understand, and I'm not saying you should give it a name necessarily, but you can't just say that anything that stands for progress, you stand for it. You must stand for something. So for example, do you, do you believe in um, free education? You said you thought the FESHS was... Was, was, was a mistake. I, what, what's, what do you, what's, what's, your, what's your view towards the Bretton Woods institutions, for example? Do their policy prescriptions help us? Do, are you a neoliberal economist or an heterodox economist? You, you can't just tell me that you believe in something that works. I need to. I, I understand. understand yeah, where, where do you stand? I understand where you're coming from. If you ask me, do I believe in the Bretton Woods institutions? I'll say maybe. But I think we can do without them as a nation. We can develop our countries with the resources that we have free of getting ourselves involved with the IMF or World Bank. That is a fact and that's my belief. So we, we can do without them. Yes. But that hasn't that's not a judgment because, on I that. Mean, you know, what what do you think of the you, I'm sure you've seen the IMF program and the milestones and the specific policy prescriptions. Four new taxes were introduced or three new taxes in the last quarter, before this budget was read, they are rationalizing um, utility tariffs. So every three months, they raise their utility tariffs. Yeah. Do you agree with those policies? Absolutely not. And again, like I said to you earlier, we put ourselves into this. They know themselves that there's nowhere in the world where taking taxes has developed, higher taxes have developed a nation. The, the general know across the world is the lower the taxes, the easier it's paid and the more taxes you collect. The reason why we've gotten here is we, don't, we haven't expanded our tax net. Very few people are paying taxes. And the systems that we've been, we have is all corrupted. So we, we haven't addressed our issues and we have allowed IMF to come in because as far as they are concerned, how do we pay, their, pay back their money? So they give you policies that they think based on what they are seeing, they can get their money out. But with these tariff increases and no, no, with these four additional taxes and no, no, we could do without. We could lower our taxes, make sure that we make our tax collection efficient and corruption free and still receive more than we are receiving now. I ask the question, why in 2023 we are using band rows in production lines instead of encrypted codes, bit my imagination. Why we have to send... Why is it what? Oh, we are using band rows. You know the stickers on, on, the, on the coke and so forth? And then, I mean, if it's visible and it can be seen, it can be copied. How would you see the difference? So, but then in real development, Brazil did so. Immediately, there are tax increases from 30% to about 70% increase. So, look, there are processes to follow. There are um, templates to adopt. As to why these are not being done, it takes me back to what I said earlier. 
So the people's hands are tied. They can't touch certain areas. Look at our ports. So many taxes. It's not the, num the amount of taxes that we tax. So that they lower taxes will lower the will, taxes. Will increase compliance. Absolutely. In the global geopolitics of West versus East, where do you stand? I, I, I am a very diplomatic person. Our foreign policy would be be friends with um, the West and USA at the same time friends with Russia and China. But you, you do know that that's easier said than done. Well, others are doing it. Why not us? But you saw the difficulty we even had in securing a, a bilateral agreement for our creditors between the, the G20 or the G7 nations and China. That, that took a lot of doing. Well, again... So my point is that geopolitically, it's not, you can't just... There are days you have to make a choice. I mean, countries like Singapore sit in there and they are friends to the West and friends to the East. We can adopt but you're this. But you're not Singapore. Well, so Ghana can position itself to get to that level where we will gain their respect for these countries and be friends with the West, USA, at the same time, China and Russia. Although you know that the USA are the people behind the IMF and the World Bank, whose policies you say will not help us. Well, I mean, they've got to be told in the face. If things don't help us, it doesn't help us. They know very well that the re it, it's, it's a lenders. You know, in finance, there's something we call lenders of last resort. When somebody has gone bankrupt, a lender with higher and stringent conditions would accept you and take you through. And that is where we are in, lenders of last resort. They know that very well, that this is not the best for us. But in where we find ourselves, that is the only solution they can give us. Are the ratings agencies fair to us? Well, I mean, to be, to be honest, if you, if you are not borrowing money, what do you need rating agencies for? So are you saying you can run Ghana without borrowing? Of course, I mean, look, if we run Ghana... You can run an economy without borrowing. We can, we can run Ghana to perfection without borrowing after a certain period. Because, this, look, we have everything in this country. Look at the resources. Even everything. So why do we have to go with our caps outside borrowing money from people? So raise the money by lowering tax rates. Raise the money by lowering tax rates. It brings a lot of people into the tax net. Have efficient way of collection. Mm. You have enough resources. Make sure you process your raw materials. You are not giving your gold, your diamonds, your bauxite, your manganese, your coal, your kaolin, your cocoa, everything out, and then bringing it back at a higher rate. You are processing all these things. I know there's caveats to it. To be honest, it's not going to be that straightforward. But if you're really mean to help your people, if the decision making is not self, but you are selfless, these decisions can be taken. And Ghana will be a prosperous nation. This is where we all want Ghana to be. Well, he says he's launching the campaign on the 21st of September. So we have a few weeks to find out. So this is just a, he says, a pre campaign launch interview. So we are basically scratching the surface. Thank you for talking to us. Um, we wish you well. There's still a long way to 2024 and a lot of ground to cover, but I sincerely wish you well. Samankra is an economist and um, investment banker and also a presidential aspirant for 2024. This has been The Point of View. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.